Released by Square in 1994 for the Super Nintendo, Final Fantasy VI would be the turning point and start of a new era of games for the franchise. It was directed by Hiroyuki Ito, one of the last original crew members since the original Final Fantasy, who would later direct Final Fantasy IX and XII, and Yoshinori Katase, who would later direct Final Fantasy VII and VIII, though it was still written by the series' creator, Hironobu Sakaguchi. For story, it was decided to feature an ensemble cast of characters, in which none of them were the official main character, so stronger writing would be needed for the 14 main playable characters, as party leadership would change hands several times. Also, the story would no longer be about the iconic crystals, and the world's setting would be a more modern, industrial-heavy one with steampunk vibes. In addition, for the first time in the series, the player had greater agency in the story with several multiple-choice scenarios with real consequences for the rest of the game, as well as the second half of the game being completely non-linear while still maintaining a focused story. For music, for the first time in the series, every main character, even the villain, would receive their own theme music, and many of the series' longest orchestrations would be composed, such as Dancing Mad, the ending theme, and the operatic aria de mezzo carattere. For progression, like Final Fantasy IV, each character is based on iconic class roles and has a unique special ability, but beyond that, relics can now be equipped to impart even more abilities to further customize characters. In addition, the Magicide or Esper system were plot-related artifacts that allowed characters to learn magic and permanently improve stats beyond normal progressions, meaning nearly every character could be customized into nearly any role. For combat, Final Fantasy V's ATV system would be used again, though only four teammates could be fielded at once, but introduced a new mechanic called the Desperation Attack, in which once dropped to low health, every character had their own custom overwhelming attack that could come out, a mechanic that would be reused in later installments. The game also introduced party switching to the series, allowing the player to switch which active team members they wanted to use in battle, while being free to swap with benched members between dungeons. Also introduced was dynamic party shifting, in which when the group was split into multiple parties to tackle a dungeon or scenario at the same time, the player could switch control between the groups between battles. Finally, the game started a few more series firsts, such as non-human party members, secret optional party members, unique sprites for different weapons the characters can wield, a monster arena coliseum, the iconic series monster Cactuar, and breaking the fourth wall multiple times for comedic, introduction, or instructional reasons. Keep in mind, the original American release of this game was a censored version called Final Fantasy III, so don't mind minor discrepancies. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. 1,000 years ago, the War of the Magi left the world scorched and suddenly devoid of magic. Now, people have long since moved on in advanced society using science and technology, though there are still those who would seek to rediscover the lost power known as magic. We now see two soldiers of the Empire, Biggs and Wedge, string along a mysterious girl as they pilot their mech suits seeking to capture a powerful magic being called an Esper that has been discovered in the town of Narsh. They comment on Terra's powerful sorcery as they cross the snowy field outside of town, but also remark she's safely under a mind control crown. The town guard is crushed under their magitic armor as they force their way to the recent mine shafts that unearthed the Esper. Finding it, the Esper seems to suddenly send out waves of magical energy, killing Biggs and Wedge, making a connection with the girl, and destroying her mech. The next thing she knows, she wakes up in a stranger's home who found her in her moved her slave crown, though she can remember little of her past and magic beyond her own name, Terra. Suddenly, town guards catch up to her, demanding her capture, and though she tries to escape through the mines, she is cornered, takes a bad tumble, and is knocked out. She dreams of the recent past, in which Imperial Court Mage Kefka was the one to place her under his control with the Slave Crown as a test to carry out its effectiveness and leverage Terra's destructive power. She recalls being a doll of the Empire, and once, Emperor Gestal, alongside his right-hand man Kefka and Generals Leo and Celeste, made the proclamation that he was on the eve of reviving magic and using it to take over the world. At the same time, Locke, the treasure-hunting rogue, comes into the home of the same old man, who remarks Narch can only win its independence from the Empire if it joins forces with the underground resistance movement, the Returners, whom they are both members of. As Terra was really a mind-controlled tool of the Empire, if they save her now, perhaps she would aid them in her cause with her power. Locke agrees, and is told to also make his way to the Kingdom of Figaro and speak with its king. As he swings into Terra's rescue, he finds her unconscious, and himself terribly outnumbered. Fortunately, a platoon of well-armed and adorable Moogles come out not only offering to help Locke and Terra, but also defend their home. One of the squad leaders, named Mog, is actually a powerful geomancer, able to dance and channel the power of the planet to help win the battle. After the fight, Terra wakes up with brief amnesia, and Locke swears to stay by her and protect her until her memory returns. Heading south and crossing the desert to Figaro, they enter its high-tech castle and meet with its young king, who's also a master machinist and a ladies' man, Edgar. On the surface, Figaro and the Empire are allies, and after hitting on Terra and failing, Edgar leaves with Locke as it turns out he's a double agent working with the Returners against the Empire. 
As Terra begins figuring herself out, she learns Edgar is such a young king mainly because his father died relatively early, and his twin brother Sabin relinquished the throne and left their kingdom in pursuit of a monastic life. At this time, Kefka, the self-serving and short-tempered mage himself, arrives on the doorsteps of Figaro, following rumors of Terra's escape there. Edgar decides to lie and cover for Terra, but in response, Kefka uses his magic to set fire to the whole castle and pressure Edgar to surrender her. Edgar gives a signal and leaps down to the few readied steeds of his chocobo knights, and tricks Kefka into coming out to confront them. Once outside, Figaro Castle locks out Kefka and transforms into a land ship, able to even submerge and move in soft earth and sand, burrowing underground and literally leaving Kefka in the dust as the group flees. However, the magic armor is fast enough to catch a chocobo, and as they fight together for the first time, Terra shocks both Edgar and Locke with a show of magic. However, they quickly realize that Terra isn't the witch the rumors say she is, despite her power, and accept her for who she is, and Terra is grateful for their friendship. After the battle, they ask Terra to meet with their leader, Bannon, not only as a key player of the war, but also to help her understand herself. Traveling to the town of South Figaro, they spot the mercenary legendary ninja assassin, Shadow, though decide not to do business with him for now. Further along, they pass by a lonely cottage and Edgar is surprised to find evidence of his brother there, who apparently is left for the nearby Mount Colt to confront his martial arts master's killer. Their progress is halted by Vargas, a training rival to Edgar's brother Sabin who attacks them, but Sabin himself intervenes, upset at Vargas killing their master, who also was Vargas' father. Vargas blows the rest of them away with his own techniques, but Sabin stands his ground, channeling his powerful key with secret school blitzes, and pummeling Vargas with dozens of blows so fast he didn't know he was already dead. Turning now to the group, the Figaro brothers are reunited for the first time in years, and Sabin offers to lend his muscles to the aid of his brother and fight the Empire. Arriving at the next mountain over, they enter the Returner's hideout and meet Bannon, who asks Terra to help them fight the Empire. However, Terra is unsure as she doesn't really have a motivation to go and fight the Empire, even though used as a puppet, and can't understand why strangers would place so much hope in her. Regardless, a wounded messenger limps in that South Figaro is the latest victim in a string of hostile occupation invasions done by the Empire recently, and worse yet, they are on their way here. Immediately, Locke mobilizes to return to South Figaro and sabotage troop movement there to buy the time. Meanwhile, Edgar wishes to return to Narsh via a river and investigate the Esper the Empire failed to claim. Bannon agrees and joins the group and Terra agrees to come as it may be a clue to a ability to speak with Espers. Hopping aboard a raft, they ride the currents and protect Bannon until they bump to a very loud and lecherous octopus named Ultros, who attempts to grab Terra. Fending him off, Sabin dives in after Ultros but overshoots and is swept away by the raging river. At this time, three scenarios play out concurrently, and with Terra, they manage to arrive safely outside Narsh again. Sneaking in, they meet with their returner contact from before, and he informs them Narsh declined their help, wishing to stay neutral in all this. Turning to Terra, Edgar and Bannon now must leave the Esper in her hands. Over with Locke, he sneaks back into South Figaro, steals the clothes straight off a merchant and officer there, infiltrates the troops, and sees one of the enemy generals chained to a wall and getting beaten up under charge of treason. She's actually Celeste, the mage knight produced by the Empire's genetic engineering, but is also still pure-hearted. Apparently, during the conquest of the resilient eastern kingdom of Doma, she opposed Kefka's tactics of poisoning their water supply and mass murdering everyone there. She's punched until she blacks out, and after the guard gets light, Locke sneaks in and frees her. She's surprised at his attitude during her rescue, and as she can barely move now would be a burden to protect, Locke jumps in at the opportunity to swear to protect her, though it turns out she actually has the ability to use magic and siphon it too, which aids in their escape as they also head back to Narsh through the caves. Finally, Sabin has drifted far away and happens to run into Shadow again, who tells him he's outside the military imperial camp and is about to attack Doma Castle, and the only way back to Narsh is through Doma. He offers to show him through, but since he's a mercenary not being paid for this, this isn't a permanent partnership. In the Imperial camp, its apparent General Leo is the more popular and respected one, but Kefka has been seizing more power for himself recently, which worries the troops who question if he's even human. Kefka comes out right as the assault on Doma Castle begins, and their numbers overwhelm the Doma forces. Within, Kayen, samurai retainer to the king, and master of the eight techniques of the Hisatsu Ken sword style, suggests going straight for the commander and defeating them to cripple the invasion. Making his way to the enemy commander, Kayan is a manslayer, easily cutting through all troops in his path, and the enemy flees when they see his victory. Doma then decides to use the window to tighten their defenses and stall out the enemy invasion. This news reaches General Leo in camp, who, in wisdom and compassion for his troops, decides to respond to Doma's turtling with patience, though he is suddenly summoned back to Emperor Gestal, leaving command of the army to Kefka. Nearby, Sabin notes what a good guy General Leo actually is, but the vile Kefka impatiently decides to reenact his plan of poisoning the water supply of Doma, despite Leo's request to fight this war humanely. 
Kefka orders the poison to be dumped, despite his own soldiers in the way, and Sabin can take no more. He jumps out before Kefka, but the mage has no intention of slugging it out, instead opting for a fighting retreat and distracting Sabin long enough to dump the poison and watch gleefully as the effects are almost immediate. Kayan recognizes it as poison and rushes to check in on the king, but sees he's too late. He and another century are all that's left of Doma's forces, and Kayan is horrified to see his wife and child among the victims. He flies into a rage, swearing no quarter to the Empire, and storms single-handedly into the Imperial camp. Sabin comes in, offering to help him fight the soldiers, and Psycho Cyan calms down after a few fights. With the window to escape open, they hijack a few Magitek armors and rampage their way out of the camp. With nowhere to go, Kayan opts to also help Sabin to Narch and points out a route they can take to the south beyond the forest. However, as they enter the forest, they notice things are starting to get a little spooky, and they see a train and railway of Doma Kayan was positive has already been destroyed. Sabin thinks there may be survivors of Doma inside, so he opts to check it out, but Kayan gets a bad feeling about this. The doors lock behind them, and Kayan suddenly realizes this is the Phantom Train, here to carry the dead to the other side. Finding all manners of friendly and unfriendly spirits about, as well as luxurious services, they are ambushed by a person claiming to be the Master Swordsman Siegfried, though he is laughably weak, and afterwards they head to the engine, keen to get off the train before it's too late. Forcing the emergency brakes, the train itself comes alive, and the group is now forced to outrun and fight the train at the same time. Fortunately, Sabin's sheer strength is enough to suplex the entire train, and it concedes to allowing only them off. Still, it must do its rounds first, and Kayan is distraught to see his wife, child, and the dead of Doma get on, forced to say goodbye as the Phantom Train rolls out. They are dropped off near Baron Falls, where to the south are the Wildlands of the Velt, where every monster in the world cohabitates. Shadow takes his leave at this time, and Sabin is grateful for the ninja's help. Figuring the fastest way down the colossal waterfall is by jumping, they leap off the Baron Falls, fight in mid-air all the way down against the aquatic monsters pursuing them, and are knocked out with a mighty current as they are swept up onto the Velt. There, they are found by a boy named Gao, who survives in this no-man's land by living with the beasts and harnessing a primal energy within, enabling him to rage out and copy any monster and their powers. Sabin comes too, which startles Gao away, and they make it to the frontier village of Mobley's, where they buy a meal and learn of an underwater breathing device. They return to the Velt and give the meal to Gao, who cheekily insists they give him more. Sabin and Gao scuffle and find themselves respecting each other's strength, and Kain invites Gao to be their friend and come along with them. In return, Gao gifts them with the scuba gear he swiped from Mobley's village, and the party now opts to ride the Serpent Trench Rapids, finding monsters underwater this time as they go, and this time arrive in the town of Nikia, where they grab a ferry to South Figro and make it to Narsh. Back at Narsh, Edgar is unsuccessful in persuading the town elder to take action, even though the Empire is on their doorstep, and won't let Narsh's stance of neutrality stop them from trying again to invade and take the Esper in their minds. At this time, Sabin comes in with Kayan and the dismal news that Doma has fallen to the Empire, and was wiped out by Kefka in particular. The Elder is still reluctant, but now Locke comes in with Celeste and information that the Empire is poised to attack Narsh this very second. Kayan recognizes Celeste as the general who torched down the town of Miranda, but Locke interjects, insisting she is truly defected to their side now. Edgar points out that the Empire is evil, but not all of its citizens are, like Terra, who used to be one of their soldiers. At this time, Kefka arrives with squads of troops and magitic armor to not fail again in claiming the Esper, even if it means burning down Narsh. The Elder cannot deny the war any longer and agrees to ally with the Returners, while also mentioning they move the Esper from the mines to the hills to hide it. The group of seven now march out to protect the Esper while Narsh defends itself and take this time for the new faces to get acquainted. Edgar tells the ladies Locke has a complicated past that compels him to protect women in distress, so it's really more guilt than romance driven. Celeste and Terra bond as magic users, though Terra is naturally magical while she was made artificially magical at birth. Kayan still doesn't trust Celeste, but she counters to let her actions prove herself. On the snowy hills, the group assembles and splits into three teams, using their talents and teamwork to defeat Kefka and force him to withdraw. Now before the Esper, it knocks aside everyone but Terra, and as it resonates with her, Terra suddenly transforms into a tremendously powerful being, flying away with an inhuman scream much to everyone's surprise. Deciding what to do now, they agree to split up with one group staying behind to guard the Esper, and an away team to search for and rescue Terra, who is was seen going westward. Edgar says they can use Figaro Castle to slip behind the Empire across the sea, and while in Figaro Castle, Sabin reflects on the past. The previous king died, possibly due to foul play from the Empire, and on his deathbed wanted Figaro to be divided between the twin brothers. Sabin couldn't stand the politics and dismissal of his father's untimely death, and opted to just leave it all. He knew Edgar wanted the same freedom, but Edgar pointed out one of them had to succeed the throne and protect the realm. 
To decide who got freedom and who got the throne, they settled it with a fateful coin toss, with the winner choosing their path and no regrets. He insisted on Sabin winning on a call of heads, and the rest of the ten years was history. As the castle arrives near Kolingen, they follow clues of terror and run into old ally Shadow there, though he's much more mercenary this time. As they move onward to the affluent town of Jidor, noted for its upper-class living with auction house and art gallery, overnight, Shadow is still haunted by his past. Once he was a man named Clyde, who pulled off a train heist of the century with his friend Barum, changing their bandit alias to the name Shadow. However, as they fled authorities, Barum was mortally wounded and urged Clyde to mercy kill him rather than being caught, but Clyde refused and ran away instead, greatly upsetting Barum. Making it to the backwater town of the Masa, the village dog Interceptor found him and called over a woman who nursed him back to health. Continuing on the terrorist trail, they find the destitute town of Zozo, where thugs and thieves roam the slums. Edgar finds a chainsaw to add to his arsenal, uses it to tear through the deceitful killers that obstruct their path, eventually finding Terra, disoriented and still in Esper form. An old man named Ramu appears before them, explaining that she is afraid right now and is surprised to learn from the party that her name is Terra. He reveals he too is an Esper, which shocks them, as Espers were thought to come from another world. He explains some live right here too, just disguised as humans, as espers and humans can't live together anymore, despite once ago living together in harmony. That was, of course, until humans began extracting magical powers from espers, and thus the War of the Magi was fought. After the war, the espers created their own world and lived there until about 20 years ago, when humans who knew of Magitech and espers stumbled upon it. Afterwards, espers were hunted again, and Emperor Gestal gained the power to fuel an invincible army that is now conquering the world town by town. The Espers manage to throw the humans out of their world and seal the portal, but many Espers like him are still trapped in this world and have been captured by the Empire and subjected to insane research that drains their powers. He himself has been laying low here disguised as a human, but when he sensed Terra awaken as an Esper in a panic, he summoned her here with his magic, only to learn she's actually different from a normal Esper. He explains that until Terra can cope with her realized existence, then she'll stay as a shut-in, but one of his captured Esper friends may be able to help her. He also shares that the Empire had it wrong, as the true power cannot be extracted from an Esper while it's alive, but only when it becomes an artifact called Magicite can their power truly be transferred, which only happens when they die. They agree to help Terra, and to aid them, Ramu gives them the Magicite of his fallen friends and chooses to surrender his own life for atonement for hiding all this time, urging them to stop the War of the Magi from repeating. At this time, the rest of the party catches up and they review what they know so far. The Empire is trying to drain magic from the live espers they captured, and Celeste confirms she's heard rumors to that effect, even though she's not familiar with the procedure they used to get her magic. They agree going in to rescue the espers needs to be their new focus, and split again into two groups, as protecting the esper and Narsh is even more important now. Celeste volunteers to go as her knowledge of the Empire should help, and Locke opts to go with her, though Shadow takes his opportunity to bow out of service to the group. However, getting to the Empire is a different issue, as the Empire is across the sea to the south and no boats go there, so they need to think to look for help in the southern town of Jidor. In town, they found that Celeste is an incidental lookalike for famous opera singer Maria, and the director of the opera house is distressed that Maria is being solicited by the wandering gambler, a man named Setzer. Setzer is fairly famous as a card player and world traveler, but he's more famous as the owner and pilot of the world's only airship. The director is worried as Setzer's letter suggests Setzer will try abducting Maria, and Locke thinks that an airship will easily cross the seas south and opts to set up a meeting with Setzer. In Kolingen, Locke stops by the real source of his grief, his former fiancée Rachel, who saved his life from a collapsing bridge when they were out treasure hunting, and while she survived a terrible accident, she lost all of her memories. Their relationship dissolved, Locke left to allow her to recover. After another year, the Empire attacked the town and she was one of the casualties, though right before passing, her memory returned and she called out for him. To this day, Locke feels the guilt and failure of not being able to be by her side twice now, and thus takes his vows of protection very seriously as atonement. When he did return to the town, he took her body to a crazy herbalist who managed to preserve her body perfectly, and since then, Locke has constantly pursued some way to revive her. Arriving at the Opera House, they find the director still worried about Setzer, but also cannot afford to cancel the show. Locke suggests the plan of letting Setzer crash the production and allowing him to take Maria, only Celeste will be Maria's decoy and they'll follow Setzer to his airship. The director likes this plan, and while Celeste rejects the notion at first, she actually goes along with it fairly eagerly, even if her singing needs work. To the side, Ultras happens to be there and overhears their plan and wants to foil it as revenge. After they prep for the production, the group gets premiere seating, though Locke decides to double check on Celeste. Locke is impressed how nicely Celeste cleans up, but Celeste wishes to confirm a suspicion with him that when Locke was saving her, in his mind he was really saving Rachel, though he evades that question. She practices her lines and impresses everyone with a surprisingly moving and ace performance. 
Just then, Locke catches Ultras' threat to crash the show and they spot him in the rafters, looking to drop a giant weight onto Celeste. With only 5 minutes to spare, they hurry to confront Ultros coincidentally as the battle scene plays out on stage, though they both end up slipping onto the real stage. Their director ad-libs this turn of events, and despite Locke's and Ultras' terrible acting, the group erupts into cheer as they continue their real battle on stage before them. Ultros is beaten and exits stage right, but then Setzer makes a dashing leap onto stage, kidnapping Celeste and flying away, leaving part 1 on a cliffhanger. However, the party's plan works as they sneak onto his airship after Celeste, seeing the luxurious first-class casino Setzer had built into the cabin. Setzer sees the ruse now and ignores their request to go to the Empire capital city of Vector, and their claims that the Empire is evil. He strikes them a deal that if Celeste agrees to marry him, then he'll work with the party, and Celeste challenges Setzer to a coin toss to settle it. Hence, he goes with them, tails she marries him. As she gets a coin from Edgar, the gambler can't resist the game and accepts, and the fateful coin toss comes up heads. Setzer inspects the coin and is amused Celeste used Edgar's two-headed coin to dupe him. Still, he takes a liking to the party and honors the bet, anting up the stakes of the game with his life and airship, the Blackjack, on the line. With the world open to them now, they travel to the imposing capital city of Vector, though land outside to avoid suspicion. They make it to Vector, where the city and citizens are highly convenienced by the innovation of the Magitech Research Lab there. In fact, they learn Kefka himself was the first prototype Magic Knight from the lab, but something mentally snapped in him ever since, and also, General Leo actually refused Magic Infusion. They receive a helpful distraction from a Returner sympathizer in town, and sneak onto the girders leading into the facility. Once inside, they navigate past all the factory machinery and spot Kefka within, getting drunk with the power they are extracting from the Espers, and mentioning something about restoring the statues. They then see him toss the bodies of the drained Espers out with the common garbage. Upon inspection, the Espers lash out at the party, though with their new gift of magic they stand a chance. Fortunately, the Espers recognize Ramu with them, and with their last bit of life, agree to trust their fate to the party as Magicite. Finding a lab with the escaped Espers, the Espers choose to give themselves as Magicite as well, but the party was spotted by Professor Sid, who was intrigued to learn an Esper's powers truly transferred when they die. The Magicite break out of their containers and are claimed by the party, and Sid wonders if Celeste came back to them as a spy. Now Kefka comes out happy to learn that Magicite can be claimed by dead Espers, and orders Celeste to give them all of their claim Magicite. Celeste urges Locke to believe she's not a spy, but he hesitates, and in doing so, Kefka takes the opportunity to knock them down with magic and soldiers. Wanting to prove her loyalty to the party, Celeste then stands up to counter Kefka's magic and teleport all foes away with her. Sid comes out and decides to help the party, explaining he was used by Kefka like Kefka is using the Empire. Seeing now the true nature of magic, he's inspired to go to the Emperor directly to talk to him about stopping the war, but for now he'll help the party escape on behalf of Celeste, whom he raised since a baby like his own daughter. Wishing to atone for the crimes he helped enable, Sid sends the party away on a rapid railcart that gets the party out pronto, despite pursuing monsters. Setzer is on standby in the Blackjack, and after they destroy the crane arms Kefka deployed to capture them, they return to Zozo, catching Setzer up to the party's story thus far. Returning to Terra, one of the Magicite resonates strongly with Terra, and suddenly, Terra not only comes to her senses, but also remembers her past that she was actually born in the Esper's world. The Magicite in particular, Medine, shares with him his story, as he was once the gatekeeper to the Esper world when he once found a collapsed woman named Madonna. He helped her recover, and while there was friction at first, they became closer and eventually fell in love, with a child they named Terra resulting from the union. Two years passed, and Gastal and his army believed and followed the ancient writings telling of the Esper world, invading it and abducting every Esper they could. The Elder decided to raise a magic barrier that would eject the invaders, but Madonna suddenly took Terra to the gate, and when Medine went to get them back, he was too late, and they all got swept out of the Esper world, which sealed itself again. Madonna urged Gastal to take care of Terra, and Gastal was fascinated at the hybrid baby, intending to use it to further his power, so he killed Madonna and captured Medine to close any witnesses. After the story, Terra was restored to normal, accepting of her father the Esper, and more in control of her powers now. Seeking to strike back at the Empire, they return to the front lines at Narsh, where the town has finally decided to stand against the Empire. At the moment, the plan is to combine Narsh's resources with Figaro's machinery to assault the Empire, but they are still short on manpower. However, were they to ally with the Espers, they could catch the Empire in a pincher attack, but this means they must approach the Esper world to convince them to ally with them. The Espers have plenty of reasons to distrust them, but Terra can act as an ambassador, given how our very existence proves Espers and humans can exist together. She agrees to help, though along the way they spot a thief named Lone Wolf make off with a treasure. Giving chase, they follow him to the same caves of Sasquatch is rumored to live in, and when they corner him next to the Esper, he takes a Moogle hostage. However, this isn't just any Moogle, but Mog, who struggles against his captor and leaves both of them on a limb. Returning the life-saving favor, they save Mog, and he surprises them with not only his ability to talk, but ability to sass and dance. 
Lone Wolf gets away, and Mog tells him he was told in a dream from Ramu to expect the party here, and he's actually eager to join the group. With another ally in tow, they arrive before the gate to the Espo World, then must cross through a camp the Imperial set up there. However, they find it eerily abandoned, and pass on through to the sealed gate itself, but when they are about to approach, Kefka comes out, having followed them there. Gassel figured Terra would approach the Espers, and so let the group approach the gate unopposed, and figured they would open it for them. The group holds off Kefka to buy her time to ask the Espers for help, and the gate actually opens for her in her Esper form. The power beyond makes even Kefka nervous, as Espers like Bahamut and Death Gaze come out, blowing Kefka and the group away. This causes a rock slide to bury the gate again, and they note the Espers headed off towards Vector, glowing with an obvious anger. Following in the Blackjack, the Blackjack is knocked aside by the power of the Espers, and makes an emergency crash landing. Traveling back to Vector, they see the capital city has been demolished and Returner forces have advanced in. The party is surprised to be granted audience by an expected Emperor, who deflatedly admits he has no more will to fight, and Sid explains the Espers came out to rescue their friends in Vector, learn they all died, and in their wrath destroyed the Empire's capital city, standing army, and Emperor Gestal's morale in a single overwhelming stroke. With their war machine gone and with no desire to see the world burn, the Empire is surrendering the war and hope the Espers will stop them berserking. As part of the end of the war, he wishes to discuss the matter further over dinner as a celebration for peace, though Sid urges the party to quell any turmoil lingering among the troops. As it turns out, Kefka has been imprisoned for war crimes, including the genocide of Doma. As the dinner begins, a discussion full of politics and calculated wordplay begins. As Sid decides to join the Returners, the Emperor apologizes on behalf of Kefka's poisoning and is working to reverse it, and agrees with Celeste that the war was foolish, especially in light of the rampaging Espers. He orders an immediate end to the war and urges them all to cooperate to soothe the rampaging espers whom have headed north to Crescent Island. They will not trust a human, but Terra can speak to them and they ask for her help on this. The party agrees, and on this mission, Gestalt has the renowned General Leo accompany them. Locke volunteers to go with Terra, but urges the rest of the group to stay here and investigate, as he doesn't buy that the Empire turned over a new leaf so quickly despite the ceasefire. They all agree, and while Sid offers to help Setzer speed repairs on the Blackjack, Setzer takes the custom tuning of a ship very personally. Reason being, when he was younger, he had a best friend and rival to a girl named Daryl, who owned the Falcon, an airship that was undisputably the fastest ship. Though he was constantly racing her, one day she flew too fast and too high and never came back, and since that day, he felt he lost his spirit. As they catch up to General Leo and the ship that will take him to Crescent Island, he introduces them to General Celeste, clearly unaware she's been helping the Returners already, and Shadow, whom he's hired as a mercenary for this mission. That night, Locke meets with Celeste to apologize for doubting her even for a second and assures her he's still her friend, but she's not ready to talk to him yet. As they sail off, Terra tells General Leo that she questions which parts of her are human, like her heart, and if it's capable of feelings like love. He encourages her to give it time, and even Shadow agrees that only she can find the answer for herself. They arrive at Crescent Island and split into two groups to search for the Espers. Both generals go off on their own, and Terra, Locke, and Shadow investigate the town of Thamasa, where its rumored magic still exists. The townsfolk deny everything, but there is still evidence of the contrary. They approach an old lore master named Strago for any information on the Espers, but he also denies anything, albeit very poorly. At this time, his granddaughter, the young artist Realm, spills the beans they can use magic, and as she approaches Interceptor to play, even Shadow is dumbstruck that his dog is so oddly friendly to her. Strago still denies everything, but that night there is a fire in the house and Realm was trapped inside. Strago asks for the party's help, but the flames are too strong. He then decides to break the town taboo and openly unleashes magic to quell the flames, and then opts to charge in to rescue Realm. As Locke and Terra support Strago, they see he's a blue mage and retired mage warrior, able to learn and use the magic of monsters as well. They fight past the flames and flame monsters to find a collapsed Realm and Interceptor who is pulling her to safety and defending her. The house starts to fall on them and knocks them out, but Shadow leaps in and saves the whole group from the encroaching flames just in time. The next day, after Realm recovers, Strago admits this town is secretly home to the last of the Mage Warriors, descendants of those who claimed magic from the Espers centuries ago and started the War of the Magi, and are now shunned and thought dead for it. They used to be hunted and killed for their magic use, and while weaker, they are still magically gifted. Locke asks Strago to help them look for the Espers, and Strago agrees as payback for saving Realm. Outside, Strago exchanges a few words to Shadow, who strokes off the rescue as a bonus for him really wanting to save his dog. He leaves to search for the Espers in his own way, and the party decides to investigate a nearby cave. Within, they discover three golden statues of the goddesses, whom are thought to have literally created magic. While these are just statues the Espers made and placed here, and the real stone statues of the goddesses are hidden elsewhere, they are still brimming with magic power. They suspect the Espers likely came here, attracted to the magic power of the statues, and before leaving, they read the inscriptions on the statues. Long ago, there were three banished goddesses that began warring among themselves, and any humans unlucky to get caught between their fighting were transformed into espers and used as living weapons. 
Eventually, they realized the foolishness of their fight and agreed to stop, giving the espers back their free will, seal themselves in stone, and ask the espers to let the goddesses stay sleeping in stone. These statues also act as promises from the espers to keep the goddesses sealed and prevent their abuse. As they step away, Ultras ambushes them and seeks to steal the statues for glory, and they fight once again. However, during the fight, Realm, who was following them this entire time, comes in and casually offers to draw a portrait of Ultros. The group falls in line with Realm's ruse and trick the dumb octopus, for Realm's magic talent is expressed in her unique ability to give life to the picture she draws. Her ability to capture life is so good she can actually tame monsters, too. When faced with Realm's pictomancy, Ultros is ashamed of how awful he looks and runs away. Afterwards, Realm insists on helping the party alongside Strago after proving her usefulness, and Strago resignedly allows her along. Eventually, they find the Espers, but are soon surrounded. They sense a familiarity within Terra and begin to talk, explaining that they are the Espers that happen to be near the gate, trying to figure out how to rescue their friends, when at the same time, Terra opened the gate. They mention they suddenly became berserk once they entered this world and actually apologized for leveling an entire city, and Strago wonders if there's something about this world that caused Terra and the other Espers to lose control at first. For now, Locke extends the Empire's peace offer, and the Espers agree to come along and talk things out. Back in Thamasa, the Espers and the Empire meet together, with both sides admitting to wronging the other, and almost restarting the War of the Magi. Even Locke tries to patch things up with Celeste, however, they are all shocked when they hear Kefka's iconic laugh, and see him not only out of jail but supported by Magitek armor. He blows the group away except for General Leo, who confronts Kefka. Kefka then explains this is per the orders of Emperor Gestalt, as once he learned Magicide is gained by dead espers, he ordered and equipped Kefka to kill the espers that fled here once they were found. He kills every esper present for the peace talks, collects the Magicite remains, and orders the Masa burned down as well. Refusing to tolerate Kefka's heinous acts any longer, Leo battles Kefka, but finds this was just an illusion, as the real Kefka ambushes and backstabs him. Now, magical waves from the sealed cave are felt even from here, as the rock slide is burst open again and more espers come out to help their comrades. However, Kefka is ready this time as he unleashes the power of his collected magicite to wipe out his own troops and neutralize the esper's powers. Defenseless against the power-tripping mage, Kefka is unstoppable against the espers as he slaughters them wholesale, grows more powerful with each magicite collected, and declares the dawn of his own empire and plans to go to the esper's world. As the group wakes up, Kefka has already hurried away, so they hold an honorable burial for the good man General Leo when they see Interceptor limp in, and can only conclude Shadow also fell victim to the Empire. Worried now about the others, the rest of the group actually comes into this time, relaying that this was all really just a lie by the Emperor, and they got out just before being trapped. The party shares the betrayal that happened on their own end, including the loss of General Leo, though introduced our newest allies and Celeste rejoins them. Chasing after Kefka now, they head to the sealed gate, but Kefka's already there alongside Emperor Gestal. Gestal is pleased his ploy works so well, resulting in not only more magicide for him, but also the sealed gate being opened for them, beyond which he is sure the espers are protecting the real stone statues of the goddesses. Within, they do indeed find the true statues, and as a test of wielding the source of all magic, as well as payback to the espers for destroying Vector, Gestalt tears away the continent the espers lived on and some of the surrounding land, and floats it in the sky near his formerly destroyed capital as a literal symbol of his new rise to power. En route, Strago explains the lore of the goddess statues, in which the three cancel each other out, and should any of them be moved out of alignment with each other, then the resulting imbalance of power will be catastrophic. Wasting no time, the party heads to the floating continent and sends down a forward team, while the rest of the group fends off the Imperial Air Force attacking their approach. The group battles a stowaway Ultros and a snorting friend Mr. Typhon and a monstrous gunship, before landing on the Emperor's new island. They immediately find Shadow, not dead, though he explains they did try to kill him once he was done with his job. They assure him Interceptor is safe as well, and insist on Shadow joining them as an ally this time, not as a mercenary. Beyond, they battle a fearsome and ancient beast of pure energy, the Ultima Weapon, though afterwards Shadow steps away from the party, feeling unworthy of standing for the party's cause, given the jobs he worked for the Emperor in the past. Confronting Emperor Gestal and Kefka on the literal precipice of unlimited power, Celeste declares her severance to the Empire, and Gestal dismisses her just as quickly. He absorbs and fires magic shots, dispersing a party, and when Celeste stands up, he reminds her both she and Kefka were created by him to serve him, so she should stand by him to rule the world. Kefka gives her a chance and a sword to prove her loyalty by killing the party, and as she stands ready to execute them, she reflects on how miserable this war for power has become, promptly turning and driving a sword into Kefka instead. Kefka is shocked and snaps into a violent fury, running to the center of the statues and demanding power, though they don't seem to listen to his cries. Gestalt tries to calm down Kefka, reminding him that if he disturbs the statues, then the unchecked power will destroy the world that they want to control. 
Kefka rebels, and Gestalt quickly turns his back to Kefka too, opting to kill him before he ruins his plans. However, the Emperor's immense magic somehow isn't affecting the uncontrollably laughing Kefka. Kefka points out to a confused Emperor he's standing within the field of the goddesses, so Gestalt's magic is neutralized. However, he can influence the godlike magic within it and begins doing so. Unwieldy at first, he throws out a few bolts of concentrated magic before getting the hang of it, and the old Emperor attempts to run for his life as he's struck dead in an instant. Kefka flings the body of the old Emperor off the Sky Island, and seeking to thoroughly ruin Gestalt's original plan, Kefka shoves the statues out of alignment. Suddenly, Shadow swings in, saving the party and shoving the statues back so quickly he traps Kefka between the unstable magic field. It's too late, however, to stop the chain reaction of the balance being disturbed, and as powerful wild energy sends the party tumbling away, Shadow urges them to run on ahead as he holds Kefka pinned, assuring them he'll see them again. The sky turns to black as the floating continent begins to crumble under the rupture of magic, and the party having mere minutes to escape the collapse. Just before the blackjack, the group holds faith for Shadow, who arrives at near the literal last second and they hurry off. The mere wisps of energy erupting from the warring triad devastates the surface of the world with apocalyptic force, as countless many die from the catastrophic rending of the planet. The party is no exception, as the blackjack is torn in half under the storm, scattering every member to unknown fates around the world. As entire continents are split with destruction visible from space, time passes after the doomsday and things calm down for a new ruined world. We now see Celeste, who has been knocked into a coma, is being tended to by Sid when she finally wakes up and learns it's been over one year since Kefka's madness succeeded in destroying the world. He explains they're on a tiny island, and while there were a few survivors initially, they have all already perished. There have been no sign for the rest of the group, and Sid suggests just living out the rest of their days here quietly as family. She agrees and calls him grandfather, which makes Sid happy, but he's actually terribly sick, and hasn't eaten anything for the past three days. Unfortunately, his health fails and Sid soon dies, causing Celeste to give up all hope now. In despair, she climbs a cliff, laments how no one is here anymore, not even Locke, and the world is dying anyway. She pauses with a final farewell for the world and tearfully jumps off to her death. However, her attempted suicide fails and she wakes up as a strange bird suddenly flies next to her. In disbelief, she sees the bird has a very particular bandana wrapped around it, and suddenly she springs to life knowing that Locke must be alive somewhere. She soon discovers Sid's final letter to her, sharing what's been keeping him going this past year, which is a raft to escape on. He urges her to go on and find her friends, and as she sails, she lands outside the town of Albrook. She learns Kefka survived the Doomsday and has now become a conduit for all magic of the goddesses, meaning he's essentially a god. He constructed a tower for himself, pulled together from debris, and has already destroyed several towns from his fire as an example to any who would oppose him. To make matters worse, many powerful monsters like legendary eight dragons have also been released back into the world. Traveling north to Zen, she witnesses Kefka's Light of Judgment firsthand, and hurrying to the destruction, she is surprised to find Salmon, alive but occupied at the moment, as he single-handedly supports an entire house by himself. He urges her to save a child still within, and after doing so, the house collapses right behind them. Salmon is still optimistic everyone in the group survived the end of the world, which gives Celeste some more hope, and they agree to stand up and defeat Kefka, saving what remains of this world. Nearby, in the ruins of Mobley, as they meet again with Terra, who seems more emotionally expressive, as she has spent the past year taking care of many children whose parents died from Kefka's Light of Judgment. She explains that when she discovered all these orphans who needed her, she lost her will to fight in place of a new caring feeling she's exploring for the first time. Suddenly, Fungbaba, an ancient demon released during Doomsday that harasses the town, swings by again, but even Terra's Esper form is no match. The party helps out to repel Fungbaba, but as Terra recovers, she restates she really can't fight and so must stay here. For now, they take the magicite Fumbaba was carrying and leave her be. Traveling now to Nakia, they hear of a ship traveling to South Figaro and encounter the escaped prisoners from Figaro Castle, who have a new leader now, and will return to Figaro for the lost treasure there. They meet the new boss of the Crimson Robbers, Jared, who looks suspiciously familiar, and Celeste isn't fooled so easily, following the Edgar lookalike onto the rogue ship, through South Figaro, and through the secret cave leading back to the castle. Turtle hopping behind the rogues and the imposter swordman Siegfried, they spot Jared in the engine room sorting out a monster tangled up in it. And after leading the bandits away, he unveils he really was Edgar in disguise. He was using the thieves to return to the castle and lets them go with some useless trinkets. More importantly, he got Figaro back and now they have Kefka to worry about. With the castle fixed, they burrow to Kolingen, where they find Setzer down on his luck in a bar. He's surprised to find them alive, but is reluctant to rejoin the fight against Kefka given their sound of feet and the loss of his beloved Blackjack. Celeste reminds him that if he doesn't like the world as it is, then take charge and do something about it, like he used to. Setzer lightens up with the encouragement and says he's feeling lucky again, starting with where he knows they can get another airship. 
He leads him to the tomb of Daryl, his free-spirited best friend, and as they work through the puzzles in Undead Within, he fondly recounts the good old times. Daryl built an experimental ship called the Falcon that was faster and stronger than the Blackjack. Setzer never won it from her in a race, and she always stated that it should something happen to her, then he could have it. One day, when striving for a new record, Daryl left Setzer in the dust but was never seen after that, and only the Falcon's wreckage was found a year later. Setzer restored it and stored it in this tomb for her, but now they need its wings and power. Powering up the legacy of his fallen lover, the Falcon jets out of its submerged hangar and tears from the sea, ready to attack Kefka's tower from the air. Though, Setzer points out that before they take this last shot, they really need to find their friends. With the world opened up before them, the game now becomes non-linear, as the search for friends ensues. Suddenly, a bird flies past and some instinct in Celeste tells her to follow it, which leads them to the town of Zozo. Exploring the caves beyond and beating the legendary storm dragon within, they find Kayan, who's been sending handmade silk flowers and letters to a woman who has lost her lover in the tragedy, urging her not to let the past destroy her future like he almost did, and live for herself. When the party sees him, despite his apparent talent for poetry and handicraft, he is eager to correct the wrongs of the world and believes in the spirit of man. He mentions he ran into Gao, who actually has been spending the whole last year in training in the Velt to become stronger and confront Kefka again. Stopping by Narsh, they find Sabin's lost master Duncan, who, after a training fight that takes them into the sky, passes along to him the ultimate martial arts technique and considers Sabin's training complete. Further in town, they find their friend Mog has returned to his home in the mines, and now he's more than willing to come back to the fight. In fact, he has a Sasquatch friend in these same caves that will help them if he asks, but they need to find him first. Visiting the aristocratic Jidor, they find the art gallery owner, Ozer, has recently purchased an outrageously expensive painting, but suddenly strange things started happening. Now, strange spirits walk his gallery, poltergeists haunt the basement, and all of his paintings have come to life, horrifically peeling themselves out to attack passerbys. Fighting past all that, they find Realm and Ozer, for whom Realm was hired to paint a masterpiece, and remove a demon that has possessed her painting. The monster was attracted to the magicite Ozer just bought, so he decides to let it and Realm go. Later, they find a tower of magic in which only magic can be used, under which the cult of Kefka march in worship of him. Among the indoctrinated is Strago, who, when he sees Realm is still alive, suddenly has a new spring in his step and vigor to get back in the fight again. In the Velt, they re-encounter Gao again, who was always ready to finish the fight, and in the nearby cave they find Interceptor with a collapsed shadow. They fend off the behemoth pair that wounded him and take him back to Thamasa to heal, though as Shadow sleeps he dreams of his past again, in which he and the woman who rescued him had a daughter together, whom was none other than Realm. However, Clyde wanted them to live a peaceful life, so he abandoned them in Thamasa and left, with Interceptor choosing to follow Clyde on his new road as Shadow the Ninja Mercenary. When he wakes, he assures the party he's better and they can move on ahead without him. Seeing Doma Castle still standing, albeit still vacant, they decide to rest within, but when they wake, they see Kion still asleep and unable to wake up. Suddenly, three Dream Stooges, Curly Larry and Moe, come in and lay claim to Kion's soul now, and jump inside his mind to begin consuming it. Following behind, the party is suddenly warped to the nightmarish landscape of Kion's mind. Within, they battle the three Stooges, but also help Kion battle his inner turmoil, such as his survivor's guilt after the genocide of Doma, and his anxiety around modern machinery. They encounter the spirits of his dead wife and son, learn a demon named Rexel is toying with him, and urge the group to save Kyan. They find Rexel, growing in the rage and despair Kyan has been carrying with him, and after dancing with death, they save Kyan, though his soul is truly saved when his wife and son come out to console him into acceptance and self-forgiveness. His soul and mind clear, Kyan's swordsmanship now reaches complete mastery, and the party claims the magicite of the Esper Alexander. While adventuring, the party is devoured by a Zone Eater landworm, but bizarrely, it's bigger on the inside, with an entire cavern full of dropping ceilings, men in green suits kicking about, bouncing treasure chests, and the ultimate mimic and copy master of Gogo. It's hard to tell exactly who or what Gogo is, but during their pleasant conversation, Gogo sympathizes and agrees to copy the party's efforts to help the world. Returning to Narsh, they resume their search for Mog's friend, and when they find his lair, a berserking yeti attacks them. After they defeat it and it sulks in the corner, it turns out this is Mog's friend, the beastly strong but uncontrollable Sasquatch Umaro, who is conscripted into service by Mog. Next, they visit the Colosseum, which is staffed by Ultros and Typhon, with participants including the true master swordsman Siegfried and Shadow. After he recovered, Shadow came here as the only thing he knows in life is fighting. The party invites him along and he agrees, wanting to see how far his strength gets him. In Jidor again, the Emperor's portrait reveals the location of his valuable hidden treasures, and as the party investigates, they find a sprawling, fiery phoenix cave that needs two teams cooperating together to conquer, and at the end of it all, they find the legendary treasure hunter himself, Locke. He finds what he's been looking for all these years in the form of a magicite that can restore life, Phoenix. 
Though cracked and faded, he still holds hope onto saving Rachel, which in turn will save him. They travel back to Kolingen, and he passes the Magicite to Rachel, and in a flash of red wings, the Magicite shatters around her. Miraculously, Rachel comes back to life with her memory intact, though the magic has only given her a few minutes to live. In that time, she affirms how happy Locke made her, and how he was in her thoughts even when the accident happened, so she never blamed him. She tells him again how much she loves him, but as she leaves again, he must also leave behind any guilt. She gives him her blessing for his heart to be free and to love himself and others again, and with that allows the powers of the Phoenix to use her body to reform a new magicite for Locke. As he steps away, Locke is still recovering but admits he feels much lighter with the shackles of guilt off. He's ready to get to work again and even allows his friends closer. With one more ally left, the entire group returns to Mobley's, where Terra announces the teenager couple there is having a baby, and Fumbaba comes back to terrorize the village and blows the group back. Terra then finds the courage within herself to step up, a sooner of Esper form, and fight, and the group manages to beat the ancient demon once and for all. At first, the children are frightened of Terra's Esper form, but they soon realize it's still Terra underneath, and they come out to cheer for her. Surrounded by appreciation, Terra finally comes to learn the feeling of love that she's sought for in her life, and holding on to that is willing to fight to protect it and the future, finally rejoining the party. The entire crew assemble to travel the world, defeating the eight legendary dragons and finding an ancient lost city ravaged by the last war of the Magi, wherein they learn of the history of the Esper Odin and his star-crossed love with the human queen. They also find Gao's real father, but during their reunion, the man denies Gao as his true son, and it comes out that when Gao was born, his mother died during childbirth. As a result, the man went mad, took the newborn Gao, abandoned him in the wild, and denied both their existences since. Undeterred, Gao swallows the rejection, stating he's just happy knowing his real father is actually alive. Ready for the final encounter, Celeste questions what will happen if they destroy the statues of the goddesses, and Strago conjectures it will likely mean all espers and magic will disappear from the world, which begs the question of the fate of a hybrid like Terra. Focusing forward, the crew of 14 friends and allies split into three teams to take out each of the three goddess statues, and each team is pushed to the limit against the world's strongest monsters, like the return of Ultima, Inferno, and Guardian. Confronting the very sources of all magic, each team leverages their own magic and espers to finally defeat the goddesses Doom, Poltergeist, and Goddess. With the statues gone, there leaves only the true menace left, as the party reconvenes before the mad god Kefka, who already saw their approach and shows off his new power. He argues the nihilistic existence of normal humans, but they counter with the protest that the sum collective of everyone's day-to-day -day struggles, victories, and love make them all matter. They each share what they have gained in the ruined world Kefka Watch burn. Terra discovered what love is, Locke learned to celebrate the life one does have, Cayenne still carries his family's love in his heart, Shadow rediscovered friends and family, Edgar fights for freedom and his kingdom, Sabin fights for his brotherly love, Celeste cherishes those who have accepted her, Strago and Realm appreciate each other more as family, Setzer fights for his lost friend and her love, and Mog fights for his new friends here, as does Gao and Umaro. Kefka laughs at the corny speech they just gave, fires off another earth-rending laser of power, and builds a fiery spire from which he will crush what hope for life remains in this world. The party clashes now against the god of magic's rising monstrous forms, before his final one-winged angel, one-winged devil divine form that descends down with the same cackling laugh. Standing together as the last bastion for hope for the future of a rebuilding world, the group of 14 all finally defeat Kefka, the mage knight turned god who wanted to watch the world burn. As Kefka disintegrates, so too does the Tower of Debris he assembled. As the game concludes, each of the party members leverage their talents one last time to get to the Falcon in time to escape. As they leave, their magicite begins to crumble as well, and Terra collapses, suddenly very weak. Kaya, the last samurai, overcomes his prejudice against machines and accepts them for the tools they are. Setzer, the gambling airship pilot, shows you sometimes have to go with your instincts instead of always relying on luck. The brothers Figaro, Edgar and Sabin, understand they both still love their kingdom as Sabin is glad his freedom has allowed him to become strong and of use to Edgar. Mog, the slam dancing commando Moogle, still retains a sense of humor, and Umaro, his Sasquatch friend, helps out with his Giga's strength, breaking open new paths that lead the party out. Gogo, the master mimic, is just Gogo, as only his talent gets them out of the sequence locks they must open to progress. Gao, the ultimate survivor, uses the terrain to his advantage, taking the unconventional solution forward. Celeste, the former Imperial General, stops on a collapsing floor to grab the bandana to save her from killing herself, but Locke, the treasure hunter, dives in to save her from really dying this time, promising never to let go. Terra, the human Esper child, receives a farewell message from her father, Medin, who shares her Esper powers will also go, but if Terra's human side is strong enough, then she'll live on as a normal human. Realm, the sassy Pictomancer, gives Strago a shoulder, and says she looks forward to drawing normal portraits now. 
Shadow, Realm's father with a bloody past, chooses to stop running now and sends his faithful hound interceptor away as he settles down in a small corner of the ruins and awaits his fate. Strago, retired lore master, still refuses to accept his age as an obstacle to his ability. Finally, you, the audience, are thanked for your agency in this production. As the game ends, the Falcon dashes out of Kefka's ruins and Terra's strength leaves her as she begins to fall. Setzer and the others recover from the death-defying escape and are relieved to see Terra on board thanks to Setzer's amazing catch, as they fly over a world rebuilding a new future without magic. Despite the legacy appeal of its 16-bit sprite designs still used to this day and tremendous critical acclaim, Square thought graphics to be one of the main reasons this game was not as high as commercial success in America for the time. With 3D rendering being pioneered for games and anime catching on mainstream, a CGI tech demo featuring Final Fantasy VI was later unveiled to positive reception, leading it to be the skeleton for the later game, Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VI has enjoyed the success of selling 4.5 million copies worldwide.